anything from it. It's the Hilbert transform. So uh, it, it plays an, a special role. So this kind of derivation that goes with the Hilbert transform, which we ran into several times before, this is our, our, uh, our guy. So we, remember, we had this uh, difference quotient derivation, delta j, uh, which, well, if you like, it's defined by saying that when you differentiate the variable xi, you get uh, 1 tensor 1. Um, but another way of saying it was the, the so this was j, uh, ij from 1 to d if you have d variables. But in the case that d is 1, um, you can think of it as a map from polynomials in one variable to polynomials, commutative, ordinary polynomials in two variables. Uh, so this dj normally is a map from polynomials in d variables to the tensor power of that algebra. Um, and, and in this case, it's just a difference quotient. It's uh, taking a polynomial p to this function of two variables, which, you know, of course, is also a polynomial. Now, what we frequently encounter are equations of this kind, that when you evaluate tau on something, cj, multiplied by q, then we get tau tensor tau of dj of q. Another way of saying it is that this xij is simply the adjoint of this derivation del j applied to 1 tensor 1, right? Because, of course, our dot product xy uh, is just tau of xy. That's in, in the case that x and y are self-adjoint. And so if you look at uh, tau of uh, xij q, uh, this is just the dot product of xj and q. And to say that this is, on the other hand, tau tensor tau of 1 tensor 1, uh, sorry, of uh, djq, you can think of it as 1 tensor 1 djq. And so now if you equate it like this, then you see why I'm saying that this is like applying the adjoint. Uh, is, is, is there a question or somebody simply dying a slow death? <laughs> oh, it's Ian. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, we had several examples of this, as I mentioned. One example was the semicircular law. Uh, that was the case where xj was just equal to xj. And in fact, in that case, this equation was simply the characterization of the semicircle law. Another example that uh, we briefly touched upon is limits of random matrix models like that. So you, you choose matrices at random with respect to uh, some measure that looks like that. In that case, uh, we also had an equation like this with Cj being what was called the cyclic derivative of V. Right? And so that was under some assumptions on V. Now, um, this uh, object in free probability theory is an analog of a classical object. And this classical object is called a score function. Namely, if you have a classical uh, probability measure with density rho, it's just the derivative of the log of rho. I mean, it should kind of remind you of this, right? If, if, if rho is e to the minus v, log rho is more or less v. So when you take the gradient of it, you get this, this, uh, the derivative of v back. Um, it's also, of course, just being the logarithmic derivative, just that. And it plays an important role in, in classical information theory. I mean, the L2 norm of this guy, which of course is the integral of this thing against rho of x, although usually when you look in the book, they of course cancel one of these rho of x. So it will be the absolute value of rho prime squared over rho, um, is up to a constant, the derivative, this is called the Fisher information, and up to a constant, it's the derivative of entropy under a Gaussian perturbation. So if you take you admit your, um, uh, distri your lower rho, and you convolve it with a Gaussian of variance t, uh, and then you compute the entropy, which is that, the derivative of entropy under this perturbation, I'm, I, maybe I messed up the factor of 2, ends up being this Fisher information. OK? All right. Now, uh, in cases that we looked at, uh, this dj of p, this derivation, was in fact given as a commutator. 
So this was the way we proved that it exists in the semicircular case. And this RJ, in our cases, was bounded. Sometimes it can be unbounded. Um, and you know, notice that this equation actually defines RJ um, you, almost uniquely. I mean, you can perturb it by anything that commutes with everything in your algebra. So it's defined up to, up to something that's in the commutator. And there are some choices. I mean, in the semicircular case, we often make the choice that RJ adjoint kills 1, and then RJ1 will be our CJ in that case. Or you can sometimes make the choice instead that RJ is self-adjoint, in which case RJ is, uh, gives you, I think it's wrong, I think twice CJ or something. I'm not sure if 2 is on the right side. Um, and you know, in the classical, in the sorry, one-dimensional case, when d equals 1, I mentioned that the derivation is just that. But this you can write, if you think about it, as a commutator between p and something that has the integral kernel 1 over s minus t. And that's, of course, the Hilbert transform. So you can write it this way. And then from that, you recover that this c is just the, the Hilbert transform of the density. This is just that equation there. Um, OK. So this. This variable Cj, it has a name. Um, it's, called, it's called a conjugate variable. Um, and more generally, we say that x1, xd are, I just coined this for this lecture, by the way, the word freely differentiable. So there's some smoothness in, in the underlying uh, law of these variables. If these um, partial derivatives, these non-commuted difference quotients, are actually closable. So they're defined a priori on polynomials. But if, as unbounded operators, they're closable, then we will say that the d tuple is differentiable. And it's not a, a, a very difficult exercise to check that, in fact, in the one variable case, this differentiability amounts to saying that your law is non-atomic. If the law is non-atomic, then this difference quotient actually defines a closable map uh, from some domain to L2 tensor L2. All right. Um, now, in the case that we have this equation, we call these CJs conjugate variables. And there's a little lemma which says that this is a sufficient condition for differentiability. So if these CJs actually exist, then we're in the differentiable setting. And the, answer, the, the reason for it is very simple. I mean, you know that if you have an unbounded operator T from some domain to a Hilbert space H, then T is closable. Uh, if and only if its adjoint is densely defined. Right? Where the, the, the domain of the adjoint is simply all vectors C with a property that um, the map, um, say, zeta into uh, T C zeta uh, is, is bound. What's sorry? Uh, zeta, what? T C, yeah, is bounded. Right? Um, so it's a classical story, right, that uh, closability is equivalent to the dense definition of the adjoint. And now the fact that this di is a derivation um, allows you to actually write down a formula for what happens when you apply di to a primitive tensor, a tensor b, with a and b uh, anything in the domain of d. So for instance, polynomials. And then there is a formula like that. and. Well, because of that, you see that A tensor B for any polynomial A and B is in the domain of D star. And so these things are dense in L2, so actually it's, it's, uh, it's densely defined. So actually DI is closable. Now, as it happens, semicircular perturbation is a good operation for these sorts of things. And the semicircular perturbation of any D tuple is always differentiable. These conjugate variables immediately start existing. All right, so I wanted to show just a, a quick uh, example of how you apply these things in functional analysis or in operator algebra. So I apologize in advance for those of you who don't care about this problem. But people that do for Neumann algebra kind of do. So I just wanted to show you as a sample, this is a very simple proof, um, just to give you an example of what kinds of things uh, we're interested in. So the setting is that I have this x1 uh, xd. And remember, they generate something which is called the phenomenon algebra of x1, xd. So this is, if you like, what would be the non-commutative analog of all essentially bounded measurable functions of x1, xd. And the question that you may want to ask is, what is the center of this guy? So what things are there that commute with everything? Well, of course, there are multiples of identity, right? Multiples of identity commute with everything. 
but is there anything else? And uh, so the statement is that if we have a, a differentiable d tuple, and d is at least two, I forgot to write it because otherwise it's wrong. Of course, if you take only one, the algebra is abelian, right? Um, but if, if it's a d tuple with d at least two and it's freely differentiable, then actually the whole thing is a factor. So here's the proof. Suppose that we have something in z and it's in the center. Well, if it's in the center, it's got to commute with all the, everything in the algebra. In particular, it has to commute with x1 and x2. In fact, that's all we'll use. Now, what I want to do is I want to differentiate one of these commutators. But the problem is that although x1 and x2 are in the domains of my derivative, it's not clear that z is, right? The, the, the operator is only closable, so its domain is not everything a priori. But in this nice case, because of special properties of these operators, you can use the theory of Dirichlet forms to regularize things. So you write down a kind of Laplacian, which is d1 star d1. And then this Laplacian is, an, is, is a nice uh, positive uh, operator. And so it has a, a canonical closure and all that. And so using that, you can define a kind of a, a smoothing operator. So this delta is this Laplacian. And you look at alpha over alpha plus delta to the power 1 half. So because delta is positive, this is always bounded. But when alpha uh, goes to infinity, this converges to identity. right? Um, and, but the nice thing is that somehow the, the, the der derivation composed with the smoothing operator is now always globally defined. That's not a very, very hard, not a very hard fact to check. So you, you call this uh, new thing called D1-alpha. It's a smooth version of D1. Now, D1 is no longer, uh, D1-alpha is no longer a derivation. But because D1 kills x2, it's one of the things that we know about these difference quotients, anything, that, that, anything that's in the kernel of, uh, of this delta is untouched by this regularization. So this thing, again, will have the derivation property over x2. So it will still have this property uh, with respect to x2, the Leibniz rule. Uh, of course, keep in mind that d1 of x2 is 0. So now we apply this to, to the fact that x2 commutes with z. We have the right to do this because now it's a bounded operator. So what do we get? We get x2 commutator with d1 alpha of z. But where is this d1 alpha of z? d1 alpha of z is something in L2 tends L2. Um, because we know that you know, free differentiability happens, we know that x2 has diffuse spectrum. So suddenly, we have something in L2 tensor L2, which you can think of as this Hilbert-Schmidt operators. So you have a compact operator, namely this guy, commuting with an operator that has diffuse spectrum. Boom, the operator is dead. So this d alpha of z has to be 0. But since d alpha of z has to be 0, we can remove the regularization and conclude by closability that actually this z is in the domain and moreover is killed by, by d1. Excellent. So now we can apply d1 to the first commutator. What do we get? Well, z is killed by d1, and x1 is differentiated into 1 tensor 1. So by Leibniz, we get this. And now you apply tau tensor 1. One of these z's gets replaced by tau of z. The other z stays the same, and you get the tau of z is z. So it's a scalar. So a very, very cute proof. OK, so, so uh, you know, if somebody asks you to prove that the Fundamental Algebra of two semicirculars is a factor, there you go. Of course, that's not, not the earliest proof of it. OK, let me prove also, with uh, uh, knowing a little bit about this differentiability, let me prove for you the subordination fact. So remember, the subordination fact told you that when you do free convolution, is there a free eraser? Oh. This board may kill somebody by falling on them, but hopefully it won't be me. Um, so remember, we had the following thing. So if I have x and y free, um, we looked at the uh, Cauchy transform uh, of, so this had law mu1 and this had law mu2. And we said that if you look at the Cauchy transform of the free convolution of the two things, this is just the Cauchy transform of one of them evaluated in a, in a different place. Now, 
just to decipher what this means, of course, g mu 1 um, of z, this is just the trace of the resolvent of x. And similarly for mu 2, so what this is saying is that the, the uh, trace of the resolvent right, is actually the same thing as the trace of the resolvent of x, but evaluated at a different place. I hope I got the brackets correctly. No, I didn't. Yeah? OK. All right. So this lemma of Voiculescu philosophically explains why on earth all these resolvents occur in free probability. What, what is so special about resolvents? Um, and the statement is this. Suppose I have a, a variable which is freely differentiable. Then, of course, when I apply my, my difference quotient to a resolvent, I get a tensor product of two resolvents. We actually used this once already. But conversely, suppose I have some function in L2 of my variable, and that function satisfies the same equation. That is, difference quotient is just the function tensor itself. Then the function must be a resolvent. Okay? So it's a beautiful fact that, um, that, that characterizes resolvents. If you like, this is similar to saying that if I, if I set, give you the differential equation d over dx of f is equal to lambda f, this characterizes f equals to e to the lambda x. Right? So these functions are the important functions for differentiation. Well, this is saying that resolvents are important functions for this kind of free difference quotients. All right, well, the proof of this is fairly easy. Suppose I have that my function uh, uh, is satis I mean, one way is easy. I mean, it's just a very, very simple algebraic manipulation. Let's, let's go the other way. Suppose I have some function f that satisfies this. So plugging in what the difference quotient is, it tells you that this difference quotient is equal to f tensor f. So in other words, it's equal to f of s times f of t. So now I can multiply by s minus t to conclude. I, I know differentiability, right? So uh, my measure is non-atomic, so it's not a problem. I know that f of s minus f of t is f of s times f of t times s minus t. OK, now you do a little bit of work to prove that actually this implies that f is continuous. And moreover, it tells you, therefore, that f at any s is just f at some fixed point t0 times that. And this is just solving the equation. And now if you, if you, I think there's a missing equality here. But if you insert the missing equality, you see that actually it is of this form, w minus s inverse. I mean, it's just, just solving for what f of s is. Um, yeah. So from that, you see that, that this function has to be of this form. And of course, w cannot be in the spectrum, because otherwise, uh, this should be w. Um, uh, it ha cannot be in the spectrum, because of course, we know by some work that f is continuous, so therefore uh, uh, w cannot be equal to s. Okay? So the short point is that this, this equation characterizes resolvents. All right. So now let's do the, the subordination. In fact, we'll prove something stronger. Uh, you know, anytime you have a phenomenon algebra uh, with one of these traces, if I have a phenomenon algebra generated by, say, x and y, I have a von Neumann subalgebra of it generated by x. And I have always a map from one to the other. I have a kind of a projection map, which in classical case corresponds to conditioning. It's a conditional expectation. So um, the statement actually is this. If I take the resolvent of x plus y, and don't take the trace of it, but simply project it onto the von Neumann algebra generated by x, then I get a scalar. A priori, this is an operator. But I get a scalar. And the scalar is just that. It's the resolvent of x evaluated at some other point. Okay? Um, and so of course, this tells you that uh, it's scalar. So therefore, I can apply tau on both sides. So it tells you that this is that, which is exactly the subordination statement that I've written here. Alice is puzzled. I may have written something wrong. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm barely re write, reading my, what I've written, and I'm kind of trusting my uh, late night writing. <laughs> anyway, so the idea is that you, um, first of all, you check a little identity. This is trivial, actually. If you start with some function, and you condition it onto x, so you project it onto the algebra of x, and then you differentiate it, that's the, the same as differentiating first and then conditioning the result. Not too bad, if you think about it. Um, all right, the other thing that you notice is that when you restrict differentiation in x to the algebra generated by x plus y, this is the same thing as differentiating with respect, with respect to x plus y. This uh, confused me for about half a year once, but I think I, I survived. Uh, the point is that um, what is the definition of dx plus y? Well, it's the unique derivation having the property that d of x plus y applied to x plus y is 1 tensor or 1 plus Leibniz. Well, what happens to dx? When I apply it to x plus y, uh, when I differentiate y, I get 0. When I differentiate x, I get 1 tensor or 1 plus Leibniz. So of course, they're the same on the generator, so there's the same everywhere. Right? And now using this, you see that if you look, you look at the algebra of x plus y, if you differentiate with respect to uh, x on that algebra, I mean, you have that equation. But since we're working on the algebra of x plus y, I have the right to replace dx by dx plus y, because they're the same, they're the same differentiation. So therefore, I have this variable here, this, this thing here. And now you just apply it to this function fz. So if I look at fz, which is uh, what's written there, I know that dx plus y of fz is fz tensor fz, right? Because, because, well, it's a resolvent, and we're differentiating with respect to x plus y. So plug, it, pl plug that in here, and uh, you see that. Uh, uh, if you, from that, you see immediately that um, uh, this, this um, uh, d, what am I saying, dx of fz, uh, sorry, of e w star of x of fz is equal to e w star of x, no, uh, just fz, right? The dx, actually, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Sorry, I'm saying it wrong. What I know is that dx plus y of uh, z minus x plus y inverse is equal to z minus x plus y inverse tensor itself. So now, uh, because of that, when I apply it to fz, I get that this is equal to fz tensor fz. So from that, I know that fz must be um, some omega of x, uh, omega of z minus x inverse, right? And so, what? Yes, you're right. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, so you have equality without the traces, and then when you apply traces, you get the equality of these two things. Sorry, you're right. Um, so you get this, and then, and then, of course, because the whole thing, of course, obviously, analytically depends on z, you get that uh, this, this omega has to be analytic. So this proves it for the case where x and y are differentiable, but by this little regularization trick, you can um, actually extend it to an arbitrary pair of x and y, which are differentiable. So that's subordination. So again, the, the key thing is this fancy characterization of, of resolvents. Yeah. And you keep y in the matrix, uh, delta x plus y on the right hand side? Here? Yeah. Because the image of this projection lives in the algebra of x. Oh. Uh, did I write it wrong? Uh, I, 
know it's correct in the notes. I may have copied something wrong. Uh, what did I do wrong here? So I'm too tired to think about what I'm doing. So. No, 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 it's not, it's not that. It's, uh, actually, what I think I need here is just x. Yeah, I think I need x here. Yeah, then, then it's correct, right. Th yeah, so this is just a typo. This should just be x. And, th and that actually is what I want to compute ultimately, because I want to compute dx of fz, which, which is that. So, right, sorry about that. So this, this y is just, just, just there. OK. All right, now, so these were just two applications of our, our, our uh, super superpower, this derivation. So I wanted to, you know, I had, I had uh, not, not so much time left in the whole course. So of course, I cannot uh, talk about everything. <laughs> so I thought I would just concentrate on one story, which is the story of, of uh, free entropy. Uh, which, which also connects very well with random matrix, matrices and you know, goes into a lot of uh, current work and, and, and very interesting questions and also connects to, to a number of lectures that happened here. So I, I would, I would, I'll just do that. So I told you before that uh, there is a classical formula that the Fisher information, the classical Fisher information can be written as the L2 norm of this classical score function. So uh, in one approach to free, uh, uh, free entropy, Wojtulescu copied that, and he just defined the, fish, the free Fisher information as that. So you define it to be this if these conjugate variables exist. Uh, and otherwise, it's plus infinity. Now, there's a very nice formula uh, related to uh, semicircular perturbations that tell you that if you actually start with a semicircular, if you're interested in, this, in the conjugate variable to a semicircular perturbation of x1, xd, then not only is this, does this variable exist, but in principle, you have a formula for it. Namely, you have to simply take the conditional expectation onto the algebra generated by this perturbation of just the perturbation itself. It's related to the fact that sj, being semicircular, is its own conjugate variable. Now, there's a price to pay, which is you have to divide by 1 over square root of t. So as t goes to 0, even though this term remains bounded, uh, this thing can blow up. And well, whether it does or does not is the, is the question of your specific law. Anyway, so that's, that's just a, a little remark for later. So one consequence of this is that you have an estimate on the Fisher information of such a semicircular perturbation. It's always finite. In fact, the, the entropy is, at worst, 1 over t. Or, N over, or D over T if you have D variables. And so then Wojtulescu defined free entropy by simply forcing the derivative of the semicircular perturbation of free entropy to be given by Fisher information. And if you think a little bit about it and notice that um, semicircular perturbations are, uh, form a semigroup, if you perturb something by a semicircular of variance square root of T, sorry, uh, by square root of T times a semicircular and then perturb further by square root of S, times some other semicircular, that's the same as perturbing by one semicircular with square root of t plus s in front of it. It's just, just like Gaussians, right? Um, so because of that, you can compute that actually the derivative of this Fisher of, of uh, free entropy is given by uh, Fisher information. And you have, you have a number of nice properties. So for example, if you look at this kind of relative entropy, if you look at chi star minus the quadratic variation, uh, this is maximized precisely by the free semicircular d-tuple, or n-tuple, d-tuple, I guess, in this case. You have a characterization of freeness. Um, if, if all the entropies here are finite, then the entropy of uh, a d-tuple is the same as the sum of the entropies precisely when the variables are free. And in the case that d is 1, so you have only one variable, there is actually an explicit formula for what happens. Um, you use the fact that you have an expression for this conjugate variable in terms of the Hilbert transform. And then what you get is this logarithmic energy plus the universal constant. So that's very nice because, of course, logarithmic energy, as you saw, is intimately involved with uh, random matrix models in one dimension if you have one, one, one random matrix, one self-adjoint random matrix. 
So all of these properties are not so hard to get from uh, properties of, um, uh, of, of, of the Fisher information, you know, more or less this formula plus a little bit of, of, um, of stuff. Now, there is a competitor definition of free entropy, and this is the so-called microstates free entropy. It's also due to Voiculescu. I should have written his name as well. And it proceeds in a different way. It's kind of rigged to look like a large deviation principle. It's not, I, I, it's not written as a large deviation principle. It's not exactly equivalent to one, but it's sort of the flavor of what a large deviation principle is supposed to say. So let's try to parse it. Um, at the onset, you're given some d-tuple of operators, x1 through xd. And then what you want to do is you want to try to find n by n matrices that look in law like your d-tuple. Okay? Now, what does it mean to, be look, to look in law like that? You, you pick a certain weak neighborhood of, of your law. So you, you specify a degree of approximation, m and epsilon. And what you want to say is that if you take any monomial of degree at most m, then the normalized trace of your monomial evaluated in your matrices is approximately the, the trace of your monomial evaluated in your uh, operators up to an error of at most epsilon. Okay? So you're trying to model uh, the non-commutative law of your, of your operators x1, xd by matrices of finite size, of size n by n. And then, well, what you do is you, you measure a kind of uh, logarithmic rate at an appropriate, uh, so logarithmic, uh, at the rate of 1 over n squared, a logarithmic uh, understanding of how likely this happens. Okay, So what you do is you take the Lebesgue volume of this set of matrices, and then you take the logarithm of, the, of this volume, you rescale it by 1 over n squared. Uh, n squared, dn squared, by the way, is the dimension of all matrices because we're looking at d-tuples of self-adjoint, self I've got to say self-adjoint d by d matrices, n by n matrices. And uh, this, this factor n over 2 log n is added on just for the fact that if you have a ball of finite size, uh, of, of finite radius in this thing, then the ball will have a certain volume which is not exactly like 1 to the dimension. Um, th th there'll be some constants that actually have some asymptotics, and to kill those constants you have to add this n over, uh, it should be d, by the way, d, d over 2 log n, sorry. OK, so that's the definition of free entropy. Now, in the case of a single matrix, um, you actually have a quality with the previous definition. In particular, you see that this thing here is just the logarithmic energy. So why is that? Well, th th this is kind of a, the usual story, that if you have uh, if, if, if you have a, a single matrix X, which you can write as U times lambda 1 lambda N 